Oh, hello. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am Liv, the woman whose entire world has been turned upside down by Seneca's Medea. Truly, like, how is it so good? How did it take me so long to read it? How can I possibly love a piece of Roman literature quite so much? It's just, I mean, oh God, it's, just, it's so good. So today I am joined by Dr. Lauren Ginsberg, who specializes in, well, Roman drama. So she was unsurprisingly the perfect person to have on to discuss this. But I was also so sure of that immediately because even our emails back and forth were fascinating enough for a podcast episode. We had so much fucking fun talking about this play and Seneca and Medea and this translation and I just... God, it's so good. <laughs> Lauren was able to provide like a lot of really interesting insights into, you know, the room of it all, all those things that I'm not good at discussing because of my obsession with Greece. Um, and yet, which add so much to the appreciation of this play, because I mean, one, Seneca lived through quite the period of Roman history, and it shows in his plays, but also there is just something about an imperial Roman writing about mythological Greece that is intricate. Ugh. And well, uh, it wasn't picked up on the recording, but I always tell my guests that like they're free to curse on the podcast if they want to, right? And when I told Lauren, she just said like, well, yeah, because the Medea is fucking awesome. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, that yes, exactly. That's right. That's why. But it also made me realize that it is uh, it's seriously possible that my series on this version of Medea might have the most uses of the word fuck out of all of my episodes. Because yeah, it's fucking awesome. So on that note, let's dive right into this conversation, the perfect way to cap off this series on Seneca's Medea. Conversations, taking inspiration from the Furies, Seneca's Medea with Dr. Lauren Ginsberg. So I don't really have like a plan so much as I just want to talk so much about this play. So, you know, we like emailed back and forth with a few things, which I'm happy to talk about everything, but having just finished it and like my listeners will have also just finished listening to my last episode on it. So that's kind of perfect, but it is, I mean, I loved it all the way through, but yeah, the last page, the last page and the last line is just some of the wildest stuff I've ever read um, yeah. in the best possible way. So I would love to know, and I don't want to put you on the spot because I read your email about uh, things ahead of time far too late, um, but I would love to know what you might know just totally off the top of your head about like, yeah. because uh, this is not um, forming a question very well, but basically, you know, like I've read so many Greek tragedies. I've read, you know, Euripides' Medea many times and I love it. Yeah. It's also awesome. It, yes. It's wonderful. And, but now reading this, I'm like, oh, they are, I mean. I I like I don't feel like I am prepared to suggest that I like this one more, but I won't say that it is not crossing my it mind. It holds its own. It Holy holds its own. Holy shit, does it? Uh, it's so good. And like, yeah. just, I mean, I, I think this is just the nature of Roman versus Greek. And obviously, like, you know, what is it, like 600 years between yeah. these two guys? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit of time. Things have changed. And Rome is a very different place generally. So, you know, even though he's writing about Greece, he's writing it in Rome. You can tell by all yeah. the references to, like, India and the Ganges. Yeah. It's yep. so cool. <laughs> and imperialist conquest. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah, it's so Roman while being still so Greek. But I just, like, Roman tragedy, I know he's the only surviving, you yeah. know, tragedian. So I imagine we don't know a lot. Like, what I was reading in the introduction, it seems like, you know, much like the Greek, we don't know how they were staged. But maybe we know even less about how Roman tragedy was staged than Greek. 
So we have like this weird divide in that we know a whole lot about how Roman tragedy was staged in the Republic, Mm. where we have absolutely no surviving play, but we have like chunks of fragments and then we can look at comedy and kind of try to see where the similarities might be. So we know a lot about how like Ennius's Medea was staged and that it was like a blockbuster and it's very close to Euripides and everybody loved it. But by the time we get to Seneca and Imperial Tragedy, We don't know a lot, even though there are so many more permanent stone theaters in the Roman world at that point than there were in the Republic. There's a lot of other competing dramatic forms that I actually think intersect with Seneca pretty well and happy to talk about them, but like pantomime, so dance, um, the idea that like people would uh, recite tragedies or perform just scenes of tragedies. So exerpting them either yeah. for small concert halls or for dinner parties. So I think sometimes when we ask how were they performed, we think that the only answer can be, oh, they were performed in the theater of Pompey in front of tens of thousands of people. And if we can't say that for sure, well, then I guess we can't talk about performance. Whereas I like to think about all of the ways that we know Roman tragedy could and was being performed at Mm -hmm. that time, even if it's for very small audiences. And to try to see how, one of the things I have my students do is to see how the same scene would take on different meanings if you imagine different kinds of performance contexts. Mm. So that's why it's kind of a hard question to answer because there are some like diehard people that just think absolutely not, they weren't being performed in the empire. I happen to be on the other side that think that they're, not only could they be performed and were they performed in big theaters, but they also could be performed in small spaces and that doesn't make performance less important that is so identifiable to me because like so I I don't know if did you listen to my first episode it sounded yes. like you did oh, okay yeah. thank you um I normally wouldn't ask because I don't want to put people in the spot but it definitely sounded like you had yeah. <laughs> so thank you but so one of the things I'm facing with this is like it happens when I whenever I read any tragedy where I'm like I just want to recite huge chunks of this yeah. text but legally I can't except <laughs> when I find a public domain translation you know so I've been reciting like little just quotes here and there from the Emily Wilson but then like when there's something that's so beefy and I just want it like I've been using this like very old um Miller translation and it's worth it for that also I've been adapting it and changing all the vows and the yees and yeah. stuff which is highly beneficial But like, I just want to recite her whole speeches. And so I can totally see that being a thing that is kind of in itself a way to, yeah, perform, to perform these tragedies. like And it's compelling and interesting, especially where she's just talking to herself and is trying to logic herself into various decisions. I think the fact that Seneca leans so hard into like, the inner brain of Medea being where the site of excitement and the tragedy is. Cause like, let's be clear. She's smarter than everyone else in Mm -hmm. the play. She's writing the play as she's going. She's the only one that's done the reading and the homework. Like she knows (laughs) everything. And so the real drama is like what's happening in her head. And I think Seneca does a really great job, especially towards the end with those monologues of showing like exactly what's going on in her brain, even when it's confusing. And that would have been so cool to see recited, danced, sung by itself part of a larger part of the whole play any way you want to do it I would be there for it I would buy a ticket yeah I mean I'm pretty sure by the time that this episode comes out uh because I I've kind of already decided I have to do it I'm just going to release a bonus episode where I just recite some of those speeches Yeah. because I just desperately want to I'm like I don't care if anyone listens to this I just (laughs) want to read it into a microphone because it's become one of my favorite things and like, they're just too good. Like, it's impossible not to. And I, I feel like I could bounce around to all these different things. But like, I mean, that's really just interesting generally that we know that that they would have done things like that. And I think, I don't even, I don't even know. I, my thoughts are going everywhere because it's just yeah. so good. And I just want to talk about everything. But one of the things, and maybe this is like a total leap already, but one of the things that really interests me is the chorus. And yeah. how differently it functions from Greek mythology or from <laughs> Greek tragedy, rather. Uh, also, not particularly Greek mythological in it, but it's just like a fascinating thing. So do we do we know anything about like, I think we don't based on what you were telling me in email, but like kind of what his intention was or if this was like a standard way of writing choruses, you know, in Imperial tragedy or like, you know, if he was doing something different. Do we know anything about that, basically? <laughs> 
Yes and no is always the question when it comes to that. But so like we have Horace's Ars Poetica where he talks about how you should have five acts and Seneca clearly is aware of that prescription and gives it the middle finger sometimes because he doesn't always do that. Um, and so there's that idea that by that time, choruses were a little bit like act dividers. And Seneca, whether or not this was common for others, is really good at always having his chorus kind of be a total tonal shift from the scene that just came. And your first episode talked about that a lot with the epithalamia versus Medea's curse. But then, you know, the next scene is Medea coming in saying, oh, God, I hear wedding bells like I'm really hosed now. And so it's really good at like shifting the audience around. But unlike, say, Euripides' Medea, actually, the chorus never interacts with Medea. Yeah. Like, we, we can't even tell if they're occupying the same stage. We can tell probably that this chorus is made up of a whole lot of Corinthian citizens, so men and women, unlike Euripides, because it's okay. an epithalamia. And so there are male parts and there are female parts that are singing. And we know in those rituals, all members of society would be coming together. So if we take that as what that form is in the first choral ode, it's all of the Corinthians coming together and they're like totally against Medea. They don't like her at all, but she never acknowledges their presence. She's just, she's not here for it. She doesn't care. She knows she's alone. And I think she actually kind of relishes the fact that she's alone, except for this relationship she has with the nurse. And I also love the nurse mm -hmm. in this play. Um, so then a question becomes, okay, it's clear then that if she doesn't acknowledge them and they're not on stage, that Roman choruses must be allowed to come on and off the stage, unlike Greek choruses. Right. So that's something that seems to have changed. We also know that in Rome, people sat in the orchestra like those were the expensive seats, kind of like they are in modern theaters today. So the chorus has to be like on the stage with the actors. So from already we can they're coming on, they're coming off. Um, their entrances are usually cued one way or another, but not always in mm -hmm. some of the plays. And that must mean they're a lot smaller. Uh, because if they're occupying the same stage space as the main actors, as opposed to an orchestra, they can't be very big. So just with that information, you can see people have all sorts of opinions. Should it be three people? Is it one person? Is it 12 people? We have no idea. No mm -hmm. one will tell us that one way or another. But the chorus both seems to be a little bit more disconnected from the action. But I think they are no... They're equally invested in like thematically contributing to the play. Um, some people like to sort of ignore them. I actually think the chorus in the Medea is fascinating because I think they bring out a lot of themes that the people inside the house who are privy to information and power aren't that concerned with. So like, what is the implication of imperialism? What happens to Corinth when Medea says she's going to burn it to the ground? It's not just Creon's problem. It's everybody's problem. And I think the chorus does reflect society in that way. Um, but not necessarily in the way that people often assume Greek choruses, where like the Greek chorus is like close to the audience. And so is modeling an audience response. I don't think we're supposed to want to respond like the chorus to this play. I don't think they're the people that are telling us how we're supposed to respond to Medea because they seem both confused and to really not like her. And I don't think that's how we're supposed to respond. Yeah. No, I mean, the idea that they're not important or like adding so much to this play seems crazy to me because yeah. I've not, you know this is my only Seneca but like they are vital they are so interesting and yeah especially that opening scene where they're just singing that epithelium like they're just I mean it, it's such a tonal shift it's yeah. such a I mean it's, it's mean. also it's so mean <laughs> and it's like and it's it's just so over the top and it just goes on and on like the way they love on Jason yeah. Is mind blowing to me. Yeah. He deserves a nice little virgin Greek bride, not that hussy foreigner that he brought over. Yes. Okay, that actually led leads me straight into a question I just jotted down right before we got on this, which is that like, so one of my kind of obsessions is this idea of like quote unquote virginity in in ancient Greece and then therefore in the texts. Um, and so I'm curious whether by this point we know whether there was like a major difference in terms of how they saw virginity like is it more of you know what the word kind of implies now versus just unmarried like was there a more distinctly sexual aspect do you know that's a really good question because weirgo can still mean just unmarried in latin but i think in this place, certainly, they mean like a virgin bride. Like yeah, she is like someone pure. who's just on the cusp of marriage, like imperial princess, nobody there before, that kind of a thing. I think it's a very patriarchal association. Probably not in all uses of the word, but I think when we're talking about marriage and like a princess that's ready for marriage, we they really mean virginity and that idea that she is she's the pure one who's going to bear Jason the real children. 
Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, certainly fits here, but also. And let's add a barf noise to that also. Like, yeah, oh, absolutely. It's fucking disgusting. It's revolting. Like, it just, it stood out to me because I recently recorded a conversation. um, They won't have aired yet, um, but it was about like uh, Athenian women, you know, and very like classical period, I think, because that tends to be all I care about. But the, the idea that like, not only did it just mean unmarried often in, in the ancient Greek context, but in some cases, actually didn't even you didn't you didn't even lose your like quote unquote virginity until after you'd physically had your first child hmm. which is like fascinating to me but that was I think more in like a legal sense uh yeah. but it's just so interesting because you know obviously we have to come at it from this like western christianized lens of like what we now are forced to think of as virginity and then like really backtrack in these cases and look at what it meant in these contexts so it makes sense that it would mean that kind of like purity like well and also because Medea really thematizes her own virginity in this play. Like she constantly yeah. calls Jason alternating between a seducer and a rapist. Like she allows this idea that he stole something from her. And so I think when the chorus says like, oh, you want a pure princess, a virgin bride, they mean their own like homegrown princess. But of course that's exactly Medea's story. Yeah. She was a virgin princess of another land and Jason did take her and have a lot of children with her. And Medea wrestles with that a lot in the way that she wants to tell herself what that story means now that she understands who he is and sees him for who he is. And so I think that that thematizing of virginity and what does it mean for a young princess to sort of be taken by a man like Jason, even Medea later to Creon, right, says, um, oh, be careful. He's teaching all those tricksy wiles to your virgin daughter right now, like back there after the wedding. So there's this idea that he's this corrupter of virgin princesses and that maybe um, I mean, Medea knows her own power, but this idea that he is sort of this um, this almost STD of a Greek hero walking around. <laughs> <laughs> Take a minute for that. That's so I'm not Jason. a Jason plan. Oh, I'm I mean, a Jason fan. I mean, no. <laughs> Who is? Uh, the, the only nice thing I say about Jason ever on this show is that Theseus is worse. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But True. that's it. But also this Jason and like, okay, hold on. Because I want to talk about this Jason a lot. But okay. I, I feel like I... I only started highlighting like literally in the last page, which was stupid because I should have highlighted everything, but I was too busy writing it. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. There is a line where like, is it after she's killed? Oh no. It's like literally when she's preparing to kill the first child before she knows that Jason is watching. Yep. And she is like, I think it's that maybe she's killed the first child. It's not totally clear. Like when exactly that happens. Which is an important question for performance to people yeah. that say this wasn't performed. I'm like, then why do you think he wrote this in the way that he did? Oh, God, it yeah. Would, like, it's not it's remotely not a problem, clear. Right? It's not a problem that would exist in performance. You would know exactly where and how. And yeah, so well, Seneca could have made it clear in a text if he wanted. Yeah, that's so true. Well, and I love, I mean, the, just the idea that this is all happening on stage comparatively to the Euripides fucking incredible it's another middle finger to horace where horace says you know medea really shouldn't kill her kids on stage and seneca's like watch me <laughs> it's so good and fucked up and i love it but so she has this line like right after jason spots her yep and she says now i have regained my throne my brother and my father the colchians keep the treasure of the golden ram my kingdom comes back to me my stolen virginity returns yeah and just like and so i think i mean that to me kind of implies you killed your oldest child. Like, yeah. but yeah, like in that moment, she's uh, going back in time. Exactly. To she's rewrite taking her story. it all back. But what you're talking about earlier too, like when it comes to, yeah, you know, <laughs> you wanted to call her Glauca. I wrote Glauca like five times in the script. And then I was like, Liv, it's Creusa in this one. Go back. Anyway, um, Creusa, like, she does mirror like she's always mirrored Medea yeah but it is way more explicitly laid out in this play yeah the idea that literally everything that's happening with Creusa is already what Jason did I also appreciate the way that Medea lays out literally everything he did like yeah in a way which is both nothing and everything oh exactly yes which is Jason right like he's the most passive piece of shit in the world who does so much damage with yeah. that passivity but he like she's so much more Medea I mean is so much more like self-aware and just like aware yeah. and wants to lay it all out like 
then Medea and Euripides is going to tell you what Jason did. She's going to sound strong and great. But this one is like, let me tell you what I did for Jason and how it saved your ass completely. Yeah. Like the entire Greek world. Like they bring in the rest of the Argonauts in this in a way that I don't think Euripides does. Like she takes credit for every single one of the Argonauts coming home. And that is so meaningful. Yeah. <laughs> like, and what she gave up to make that happen. Yes. That Greece basically owes its entire heroic system to her and yes. to her interventions. And I love that she, uh, one of the things I like in the way that she deals, because Jason, much like in Euripides, is kind of belated in when he comes in. And so we get a lot of time to like hear about him and think about him before we actually see him. And I like that this Medea, like you can see her as a lawyer in the courtroom where she sort of tells the audience, because, you know, maybe the audience, maybe they would be on Jason's side. I don't actually think anyone in early Imperial Rome would think anything quite high of Jason, but all right, where she says, all right, granted, maybe someone told him he had to marry this girl or die. And she sort of briefly allows twice, like, okay, let's try to see things from Jason's point of view before she's like, well, I mean, you could always die. People <laughs> die for love all the time. And so before Jason can even come in and utter those like utterly ridiculous lines when he comes in, I'm like, oh, everyone else made me to. And, you know, I'm, I'm just doing what I have to. Like she's already raised. It's almost like she's giving a, a pre-speech in a courtroom. Like she's already raised the only possible defense he has and has shown the audience not once but twice that it's idiotic on the face of it, that it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Because she's smart. Like she knows she knows she's talking to us and she knows that she's going to get us on her side. And I think that it's incredibly exciting to watch that, even though she's a villain too. I'm not trying to say that she's, yeah. she's an awesome moral exemplar, but she's the one that bonds with us. She's the one that, you know, tells us about her plan. Like she shares with us this like higher plane of knowledge because we've all done the reading. We all know this story and no one on the stage does. So it's a really interesting way that she manages to um, dramaturgically at least like, make us excited for what she's going to do. Yeah. Well, and I think like for all that, that Seneca's Medea is that is like your Ripley's Medea times a hundred in terms of everything you just were talking about, like how smart she is and how much she wants to lay it all out and make it all very clear. Um, Jason <laughs> is so much dumber. So than much Euripides dumber. Is, and I didn't think that was possible. I so honestly did it. Like, yeah. The idea that Jason, who I have hated forever and has perpetually argued that, like, while he is the worst, Theseus is worse because Jason, all of his bad is that he, like, basically does nothing. He has everyone do it all for him. And, like, that. I mean, that's how, how I've always seen him. That's how he always appeared. And literally, Seneca was like, hold my beer. Like, I'm yeah. going to make him such a... I mean, he's he's just absurd. The fact I think it's one of his first lines to Medea where he like asks her like what crimes he she thinks he did. And she's like, well, like literally everything I just told you. Yeah. What were you not listening? And then I forget if there's something that comes in between. But at some point he just says like, oh, well, that's what I wanted to hear. Like you've made all of your crimes my fault. And it's like. Yeah, dude, they are your fault. She it's didn't... called complicity. <laughs> yeah, like, and like, do you think that she just set out to be like, yeah, I'm going to get this random dude's daughters to kill him? Like, yeah. she didn't even know who Peleus was. Like, there's yeah. no reason to suggest that that has anything to do with her own desires. And to be clear, she didn't hesitate because this no, lady no. loves some magic murder. But For sure. <laughs> but... She is Medea. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> But she did it for love. Yeah, I like that she, and she does this with Creon too, because Creon also is not the sharpest knife in the drawer in this play, because both Jason and Creon come in basically telling the audience, this woman is tricksy, and she's evil, and she's really dangerous. And then she manages to tell them, again, in both of these speeches, I did this and this and this. I'm so amazing. I've done all of these things for you. You should be grateful. And all of them highlight that she's tricksy and she's dangerous. And then in the end of both of her interactions, she manages to do this like thing that would be amazing to see performed of, I'm just a little girl. It's so hard to be a little girl. What harm can a woman do? I just need one day. Or, oh, dear sweetie Jason, the only thing I want is that you don't remember me poorly. Just remember me as the nice little girl that I am. And both men are like, okay, seems legit. 
<laughs> like, how are you? And that's also why I think the chorus is so interesting because they're so much further removed from Medea, but they never once underestimate her. Like yeah. they know throughout, they recognize her much more than the men that she's like much more intimately connected with and close to do, but she's just so able to harness like the misogyny of these men that think that women can't be heroes, that women can't accomplish things. And she uses it against them in a way that's so satisfying. Yeah. It's so explicit too. the way, like even Creon, when he's like, oh, what does he say to her? He says like something about her femininity. And then she, he's yeah. like, you're being like smart, like a man or something like that. Yeah. Where it's like this, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, just the explicit nature of like, oh, all the masculine parts of her, that's the scariest part is so interesting. He has no idea. Exactly. No. Yeah. Okay, so the chorus too. The chorus is wonderful throughout this, but it was so interesting to me at the end where the chorus, like the first time they interact, actually, I think with anybody, it's the messenger. Yeah. And it's like this really brief thing where they're finally serving like a kind of more explicit purpose. Like I think they very much serve a purpose throughout, but they are like interacting with the play. But then at the same time, like, Based There's on... no messenger speech. So it's yeah. Sort of... <laughs> yeah. It, because it all happens on stage. Like literally right. he's like, they're it's dead. Me. Everything's on fire. Yep. <laughs> and the chorus is like, oh, it's scary. <laughs> yeah. Put it out. And you're like, well, I think he probably already thought of that. I don't yeah. think that's brand new information. He's like, There's a magic kind of water. We need a magic kind of water. And we don't have that here. I just, they, it also seems to me like based on the lines as we have them, that like the chorus and the messenger are probably kind of like maybe even on one state side of the stage talking about this while Medea and the nurse are kind of like looking as if they're kind of hiding and yeah. talking just to each other, like whispering. Yeah. That's so interesting and feels yeah. like quite unique. If I just, uh, so I just spent a month um, at the NEH seminar in Roman comedy in Boston and the similarities as I'm rereading this of the way that state stage space is used, the way that you have these two characters that like we've bonded with, because I think we also bond with the nurse. Like the mm -hmm. nurse, I think is a very compelling, compellingly written minor character. And she and Medea are clearly on one side. And the nurse, I think is like, oh goodness, this is where everything ends. And Medea is probably cackling. She's so excited that, that people are reacting to this thing that she's done. And I think, yeah, it creates these hierarchies of knowledge. And like, who are you looking at on stage at this point? Like usually the messenger would come on and you would think like, wow, gruesome speech about to happen. And like Seneca can do a gruesome messenger speech. The, these, the messenger speech in the Thyestes is disgusting. But in this one, we've already had the whole witchcraft scene twice. And so yeah. we don't need a messenger to tell us what's going to happen. Also, Euripides also had a really great messenger scene, and maybe we don't need to do that again. So instead, the messenger and the chorus, like, they fulfill their standard role, which is messenger comes on, chorus interrogates, both sides go, ah! Um, but no information is actually provided to the audience that is necessary in that scene. And so it's interesting that they're sort of placeholders for what they should be doing. But we've already been, like, captivated by the magic that we've seen in the previous scene. Yeah, they almost feel like they're kind of like a fake out even too, yeah. right? Like you're saying, yeah, you're expecting this messenger to come on and like give this whole thing. And then it's like, no, 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 we're not done. Medea's going to do the rest on stage. Like, yeah. yeah, she already explained what was going to happen to Creos and Creon. So like, you can assume we know how it all went down. And now she's here to like do the rest physically on stage. I, she I wants also... an audience. That girl loves an audience. Oh my God, does she ever? She deserves one. I get it. Killing your children is bad. This play is so good. Yeah. Um, like... It's not just, an endorsement of infanticide no. but she's a very well-drawn villain she's so good i love her yeah i uh, i probably should be you know a little bit more <laughs> critical of her but i just can't and i do this this is me and the greek one too so who knows but the uh it, it, i think the nurse doesn't interact with anyone but medea either yeah that's interesting yeah I almost or had just like with sometimes not even Medea. Sometimes she's just talking yeah, to us. Yeah. Well, it often feels like 
like Medea is kind of like off in her own world. And so the nurse has to kind of like relay a little bit of what's happening. And then she yeah. kind of like can get Medea's attention. And yeah. Like, hey, hey, like I, I also need to talk to you. <laughs> like, Yeah. I yeah. love when she first comes on and they're talking. Cause as you noted in the first episode, like all of a sudden this play opens with just Medea already knowing about all of these things and kind of like at the height, well, at what we think is the height of her anger. And we learn that it can actually get worse. So when the nurse comes on, you kind of wonder, oh, what is her role going to be? Has she been subordinated? And I love that line where the nurse is trying to get Medea to calm down. And that's a, a really standard thing in Seneca and tragedy. It's almost always an act two. There's always like a secondary figure that's trying to get the main figure to like de-escalate their passion, but their motivations for it are sometimes different. And I love that this nurse has the bait and switch at the end of her first lines where she says, if you're loud about your plans for vengeance, you're going to get caught. I want right. you to be sneaky because sneaky vengeance is what actually ends up winning in the end. Like that's the vengeance that actually meets its end. So the nurse immediately is like, oh, I'm complicit and I'm here for it. But then the nurse starts to get increasingly more worried as the play goes on. And I think she's worried that Medea is not going to be able to get away versus worried necessarily about what she's going to do. And I think that is also so interesting because it means that the first person we see interact with Medea is someone who's inherently on her side and sort of complicit in the things that she's going to do. And so we can identify with her, I think, more than um, many of the other characters. Yeah. Okay. I, I wonder how much of a stretch it would be or maybe I mean I think it's probably a complete stretch but more so <laughs> I wonder how interesting it would be to stage a performance of this with the implication that the nurse is a figment of Medea's Im imagination oh that's amazing sort of like yeah um oh that's very Shakespearean but I love it right like that she's idea that's there well and she kind of like she sees her brother later yeah. and the furies oh, yeah. and and like seeing the furies is so expected it's like well yeah you're gonna kill your children you're gonna see the furies like that's how this she works. also called on them in the first that speech, too so <laughs> yeah. they showed up yeah they listened um yeah and i mean also she the the fact that she is like here for the furies is so great and such like a perfect juxtaposition to their function in i don't know if it's like a senecan thing but like certainly in greek tragedy for the most part Finding the Furies in front of you is very bad and it's yeah. going to cause you trouble. And she's like, yeah. no, no, hi, like, come on in. It's nice to see you. Um, bring my brother with you. Yeah. But like she she sees her brother in this way that feels I mean, it's quite it's quite different to suggest that like she straight up sees him. She's like, I'm going to avenge you. Like, I don't think we really ever otherwise get a version of her that is quite so sorry yeah. that she killed her brother. And that's yeah. really interesting. Like. That's her big trauma. Yeah. Like she did it and she seriously regrets it and she's trying to do everything she can to take it back. But yeah, the idea that like that also the nurse, because I think that it could work because she doesn't talk to anyone could. about Medea and she does kind of serve as this like kind of other side, this like, yeah, like it's like almost like there's a side of Medea that does want her to calm down, that wants her to be sneakier, like you said, because she's so complicit that it's not like she's telling Medea not to. Right. She's just telling her to be smarter about it. Yeah, and there's that wonderful scene, um, I think it's the start of, of what in the translation is labeled Act 4, where the Medea, it's before Medea is revealed and actually like performs the Black Mass on the front of the stage, but the nurse sees her, and I think it's implied that we don't see her, and sort of narrates the magic that she's doing, but then like ventriloquizes her, like the nurse starts speaking as Medea oh, yeah. before Medea is seen on stage. And that's a scene a lot of people point out uh, would be really effective as pantomime because that seems to be what pantomime is, where someone is singing a song that includes first person speech and not, and then someone would be dancing and miming um, the various activities on the stage. And that was clearly a very compelling and popular form of entertainment. So sometimes I've had students like think about what that would look like if it was pantomimed. But if we take it that that's a, sort of a figment of Medea's imagination, that's yet another scene that would be really effective, I think, because half of it is said in Medea's voice. It's just said by this nurse figure. Yeah, I hadn't clocked how odd that is. Like, I yeah. noticed it, but yeah, that's really interesting. Like, I think you would really like to play the Thyestes, by the way, because it starts with a fury in hell. Oh, my God. Okay, so the, and Thyestes the, rest of the was... play takes place inside, but the Thyestes and the Medea have a lot in common, except for the Thyestes has no women in it, which is a bummer, except for the fury. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess they're except. There. Yeah. yeah. I 
so the Thyestes was already the one where I was like, okay, I fucking love this Seneca play. Like <laughs> he has a Thyestes. Holy shit. And then, yeah. then when you said that it was, I don't know what, what word you used, but like in my head, it's got to be just gross. That messenger yeah. scene. Oh, gross. Uh, yeah. Like I just, yeah, I want to know it. I want yeah. cuz I mean I have a real thing for that cursed family and yeah. all its many curses and yeah no I I mean <laughs> maybe I'll just follow up this play with the one where not only do they kill children but eat them they eat them too why not yeah, yeah. It's just like take a step up <laughs> and where the furies aren't just in Medea's head but are also <sighs> on stage delivering the opening monologue that's incredible what that reminds me that like of course I can't think of whether this is actually unique uh, in the Greek, but like the Greek, I mean, the Greek, they usually just call them the Eumenides, which I think is important that Seneca's like, no, no, like we're not yeah, using no. a euphemism here. No, like no. these are the Furies, but he also names them. Yeah. I don't know if he named more than Megara, but he named Megara. Yeah. Which is really interesting. And I can't imagine a Greek tragedian naming them, yeah. but I, yeah, like it just feels like it's like the same reason why you use the humanities. You use this like kinder term to them because you don't want well, to anger Latin, them. They're often called the Ultriques as well. So the the Avengers um, is the word that's there. Uh, and I think that Seneca is really into naming. Megyra is the one that he names the most. Uh, Electo shows mm. up and that's clearly from the end of the Aeneid and so or the second half of the Aeneid. And so I think like post Virgil, Roman poets are like all about oh, maybe poetic creativity actually comes from the Furies. Like, maybe that's where it comes from. Like, we don't need muses. We need Furies that are there. And Medea, clearly, that's what she thinks, that her powers of creativity come from the Furies. And she is here for it and very excited about it because she is her own playwright. I fucking love all of that. Oh, my God. The idea, the idea that the Furies serve that purpose. I mean, certainly yeah. for Medea, but broadly... That's wonderful. Because the Romans like do use that word of like poetic inspiration, like furor, like frenzy as oh. one of the things. And insania, like those are words that Romans use when they talk about poetic um, inspiration, like the feeling of being taken over by the muses. And because it's it's sort of aligned to being a priest, a wates. And so when we see it then deployed with like these ultimate creative villains in Seneca and tragedy, like they're talking in the language of poetic inspiration um, but they're also talking literally about their contact with, like, the powers of vengeance and evil, namely known as the Furies. So it's this amazing way of saying that, like, no, like, Seneca and tragedy really comes from below. Like, it comes from the Chthonic region and is here to take you out. I never wish that my show was video, um, <laughs> but I do feel like my face conveys a lot right now that I can't in words. I just love this so much. And it's not it's not helpful to just say how much I love it, but, like... Well, you said in the first episode, one thing that was like bigger, badder, better. And that's actually a phrase that I use a lot when I teach Seneca and tragedy, because it's a motif of like, A, everything is always the same. So like, if it's been bad in the past, it's bad now, but it's worse. It's like both yeah. the same and worse. So it's escalating. And so I think all Seneca and villains want it to be bigger, badder, better. Like they're all competing with a past version of themselves, both like who they were in like mythological history, but they also all seem to be competing with past literary versions of themselves, like past constructions of themselves. And they want this play to be one that stands out, that's more exciting, that does more. And I think that's really cool because it's kind of how we think about being a belated author as well. Like tragedy is a well-established genre at Rome, let alone in Greece by the time Seneca is trying his hand. And so how do you make something like exciting when the whole audience knows that this play is going to end with Medea killing her children. Cause once Euripides has that ending, like that's just the ending that mm -hmm. for, throughout all of time. So how do you make it exciting? And I think when Medea talks about how this is going to be bigger and it's going to be badder and it's going to be better and it's going to be worse. Like we know the fact of what that will be. And so there has to be something else that makes it exciting. And I think that's, that's Medea. It's the character. It's the way that she talks to us. It's the way that she lets us inside her brain. It's like the bananas magic that she does on stage. Like all of this is extremely exciting and would be very compelling if performed, but also is just, as you've seen, like very compelling if you're just reading it to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of that. And like the the magic, just because we have not talked enough about the oh, magic yeah. yet. So the magic is, it's so witchy. Yeah. And it reminds me so much of Ovid um, because yep. I, you can tell that Seneca was very inspired. I oh, don't, yes. I wish I knew how inspired he was by Ovid's Medea, but we do know he was certainly inspired by metamorphoses because like 
it is so reminiscent of those yeah. moments when she's flying around in her dragon chariot and picking up all those ingredients. And like, even the way the nurse explains like where everything came from yeah. is really wonderful. And we get this, like, it is a very strong callback to Ovid and to yeah. this, like, cause he wrote the witchiest before Seneca then also was like, I'm going to do it bigger and better and better. Yeah. Yeah. I also, so I have this weird fascination that's come up through, I've talked to um, some people about Roman witches on the show and like I've covered a couple, I think maybe, I don't know. They don't really interest me as much because of this thing that I've noticed, which is that at least in terms of like sir, what we have that survives Greek witches, you know, in the vein of Circe and Medea, yeah. whether they're written in Greek sources or Roman are these like larger than life, incredible figures that are just like they're I mean they're very like I don't want to say that they're you know written positively but they are if you compare them to a lot of the Roman witches mm -hmm. like in Apuleius and yeah. in it's Catullus I think right who has do you know that has that one witch Horus kind of obsessed with is it Horus okay it's Horus yeah and yeah like this like they're weird crone like witches often in mm -hmm. the roman and they're kind of like often comedic even like they're not they don't seem to be taken all that seriously whereas we get like medea and you're like well, this is a that's a witch that i want to know you yeah. know it's so interesting the kind of the difference i don't really i think i had a point that i lost it but it's just interesting the way that it seems to be like if you write a greek witch you can kind of write them in a different way than maybe was like I don't know socially allowed or socially acceptable when you're writing about yeah, a I more think, Roman one. I think there's an idea, and um, many people know more about this than I do, but an idea of Roman witches where they're both um, othered by their gender, so it's a very female thing, which is mm -hmm. true in Greece as well. But in the Romans, it seems a really codified way to separate um, religion that is acceptable from religious practice that is not acceptable. And there are so many laws against witchcraft and aspects of witchcraft that it seems to have been like a really strong paranoia amongst the male power holding elite of this like other channel towards power and religious power and connection with the gods that certain types of women could have. But it's also classed. So most stereotypical witches are of a, a lower class or are foreigners in origin. There's often a great association with Easternness and all mm -hmm. of the sort of xenophobia that that brings. And so I think that that's a perfect set of stereotypes for Medea to step into it and say, but no, you're going to take me fucking seriously. <laughs> you are abs like, I will, I will show you everything. And the fact that all of her ingredients, as you say, come from basically the known Roman world, like mm -hmm. it's an imperialist list of things that she's able to get. Um, it's also a list that, so Roman witches often are much more connected with the idea of necromancy, mm -hmm. um, I think as part of their stereotype. So I think of Lucan's Erichtho, who like literally raises the dead at one point in order to predict the outcome of Pharsalus. And Medea's being written ar around the same time as that epic-ish, who knows which one came first. But there's this idea that her power is both classing her as an outsider in all of the ways but boy, is it anxiety producing for the male power structures around her. Like they're terrified of the fact that she has this. And we get to see it on stage. Like think of the reveal when it's no longer just the nurse talking, but we actually get to see Medea at an altar doing all of these things and describing how they're going to work. I, I have no idea the special effects in the Roman theater that could make that come alive. I don't think it's necessary. But I think that that would just be so visually bananas to see. Like that yeah. would be a scene I would love to see stage today. And I think it's what it is what sort of harnesses a lot of the reception of Seneca's Medea versus Euripides is it's a lot of investment in witchy women, women who are thought of to have access to cultic or religious practices that aren't the patriarchal norm. And I think that's a powerful strand of like empowering women. And so even if Seneca writes her as somewhat of a, an overblown cliche in this way. I think that cliche is doing a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still taking it all in again. Yeah. yeah the, the Roman witches, I forgot how much, like, I mean, sort of obviously it's inherently tied to them being women, but yeah, they, the, the women aspect of them is really focused on as this like bad part, like the thing that makes them so dangerous. And I, it oh, reminds and me. Roman, Roman witches can cause impotence. And that's something that frequently shows up in the humorous aspect of them. So in Horace and Apuleius, mm -hmm. and they show up in um, elegy a lot, witchy behavior. 
And so I like, if that's not a metaphor for male anxiety about like women's access to the gods, direct access is impotence. I think that must be, un so given all of the erotic language in this play, I think that also has to be part of it as well as she can unman all of these men, but in a way bigger way than just their penis. Yes. Yeah. It's so much more tied to like, yeah, just absolute male fear yeah. <laughs> for women. That's so interesting. It feels so Roman, just so Roman, like not to say the Greeks weren't a patriarchal yeah. mess, but it's just different. A different yeah. kind of patriarchal exactly. mess. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, speaking of the women and witches, I do think it's important to recognize that like Roman women had significantly more rights mm -hmm. than Greek women. I mean, the fact that they could be property owners, the fact that they could divorce, I mean, divorce being such a common Roman thing. I know you mentioned that in your opening episode, um, but I, was I right. mean, they were much more legally and financially enfranchised than Greek women. And then also when Seneca's writing, imperial women have foregrounded like the dangers of soft power. Um, and by dangers, again, I'm focalizing the sort of male paranoia that's there rather than, you know, my objective assessment of those women. But this idea that we have women now at the center of power that make sort of senatorial men extremely anxious. And then also we're in a world in which women have a lot more economic and property and social power um, in the law than they did in Greece, I think, like heightens the stakes of trying to keep women in their box. Because when you've given them more power, there's a lot of anxiety that then goes into making sure they know the limits of that power. And I think that's also something we can see with Medea. Like she should be a divorced woman that just slinks off into the ether, according to Jason. But nope, she's not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, it draws such an, uh, a clear line to to their fear of these yeah. witches because they have reason to fear, whereas... You know, and I mean, it, it's tough with something like Cersei because she's, you know, from the Odyssey and we don't really have any idea kind of what was going on. But when it comes to certainly like Euripides is Medea, like they don't have a reason to fear women in the same way because they, especially in Athens, it like subjugated them to the point of yeah. just being completely comfortable with the situation. The men were obviously, I don't think the women were. Um, but yeah, so there was no reason to have this fear. Whereas, yeah, it was so interesting to to have this completely different world. I mean, 600 years, I have to remind my listeners of that all the time, because I think it's one of those things, like if you're just coming at mythology and, and the like ancient Greece and Rome, um, you know, from a just general interest standpoint, you pick up some random book of Greek myths, you find, you know, it, you don't get the sense that there is so much time in between these sources, you know, so often people be like, well, why does Ovid say this? And Homer says that. And it's like, well, because there's like many, many, many centuries in between and like so much changes. Just imagine how much has changed for us in the last yeah. 600 years. And so, yeah, you get this story that is set in ancient Greece. It is ancient Greece. I mean, he really emphasizes the Argo as the first boat. Yeah. That was really interesting. So he's both like putting it in the past in this really important and and like obvious way putting it in the ancient greek past but then as you were saying like has all these imperial ties and it has all these ties and obvious you know implications for where rome was at at the time that it just becomes this kind of fascinating blend of so many different things and there's so many different like little aspects to be able to look at the divorce thing was really interesting like it's yeah you're divorcing whereas the whole like crux of Euripides is basically that it doesn't, yeah. yeah, it wasn't a real marriage to begin yeah. with. So it doesn't matter. And I mean, it's also is, a, has a lot of implications for Medea's exile. Mm -hmm. Like we get a much better sense in the Euripides of like why exile is so bad for her. Like for me, <laughs> I won't pretend I haven't like somewhat, justified why she felt that she had to kill her kids in Euripides because it is far more explicit that it's kind of like either your children live in the same poverty as you because you're an exiled foreigner with absolutely zero rights you know or or they don't and whereas yeah. here it's kind of like she does she kills the children to explicitly punish mm -hmm. Jason yeah and that's so different and so yeah. much more evil and also fascinating. But it's also this idea of like exile in the Roman world. Someone, a teacher of mine a long time ago said that like Seneca's tragic world is claustrophobic because of its mm. engagement with Roman imperialism. So when you feel like 
the power structures of Rome control everything. Like exile is just separating you from a support base, but it's not, there's no freedom associated with it. You can't remake yourself. And if we think also about how many powerful women in the generation before Seneca were exiled, uh, especially Julio Claudian imperial women, that was where mm. you sent away inconvenient uppity women who weren't doing things. You charged them with treason and you sent them to live out their days on an island. Granted, none of them had access to a supernatural dragon chariot. And so Medea does have an out clause that other women do not at that point. But I even think of like the, I don't even, I won't say it as a joke, but the reference she makes to abortion in this mm, also mm-hmm. seems to be like both that and divorce show the sort of social power that a Roman woman at that time had over her own reproductive labor. Um, and many people have been quite off put by that line of I, you know, if, if, you know, we've had sex recently enough and like I have a fetus inside of me, I would also abort that fetus to punish you. And you can see why people would find that a, a grotesque thing to say. But I think it does show um, not only Medea's single mindedness on vengeance, but also that that was just a pretty acceptable practice amongst elite women at that time, access to that kind of, um, of reproductive biological control. And that would be totally out of place in a Greek play. You would never find a Greek tragic heroine saying something like that. That's so true. And I just have to say that, and granted, you know, it's because I wasn't making a practice of highlighting, um, but that line that you're talking about is like 10, 11. Um, Therefore, like literally in the last hundred lines of the play, and it is the first line that I highlighted. (laughs) Because it is, it's a memorable one. Yeah. Because I read it and I said, holy shit, out loud in my apartment. And then I learned how to highlight in my iPad explicitly <laughs> for that. It's not to remember hard. that one. Um, but yeah. And then it automatically highlighted it as red. And I literally was like, Ooh, that's good. <laughs> like I'm, Too much. Too I'm much. doing a lot here. Uh, I'm saying a lot about myself, but like, I will have quoted it in the episode. So I won't, I won't feel like I need to know, but it's so good. Cause it's yeah. not only just like a line about abortion. It's like, that's detailed. She's like, I yeah. will scrape it out. Yeah. She was like, I have that power because through all of this, I mean, in Roman divorce, the man would keep the children. Mm. Um, And so Jason is within his legal rights when Medea says, send the children with me. Although Medea at that point doesn't really seem to be saying that earnestly. She wants Jason to confess that that's a point where she can hurt him. Mm. Um, And that's her first beautiful aside when she says like, oh, he likes his children so much. Great. I have a plan. Um, But Jason is within his rights to say, no, you can't have them. But the way he says it is so weeny, where he's like, piety overcomes me. I could not live a day without these children that are there. Uh, and so in the end, when Medea is like, you actually don't have as much control over our reproductive history as you think you do. Like Rome slash Corinth has given you legal control over the children. But like, I am their mother and I can do these things that you did not anticipate because the law did not anticipate. It's just so interesting. I'm so glad to have you on to talk about this because the (laughs) Rome of it all is all the things that escaped me. Like there's so many things that I just kind of like have a good idea because I thankfully, you know, did cover Roman history in my degree, but it was a very long time ago and it's not my interest point. So I was like, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm right about divorce and we're going to confirm it on this episode, (laughs) which I was, but like that it's so interesting to to consider these things that, that are so explicitly Roman and then therefore would have been so much more impactful to the audience. And just like, there's just like Seneca was starting shit. And that's really interesting. Do you have any thoughts about like, like why he would choose to push so many buttons? Like, I know there's so much to his history and I, we won't try to get into it, but like, I mean, so we just don't know when this play was written. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm pretty convinced by the idea that he wrote tragedies for his whole career. Um, John Fitch has this great article where he looks at stylistic development and compares it with what we know of Euripides and what we know of um, Shakespeare. And so that really shows that it's over a long period of time that he develops his tragic art. I'm also pretty convinced that the Thyestes and the Foinisai, which is his final play, were written under Nero. Um, But the rest of these could have been written under Claudius. And when you look at the other literature of that time, you look at Lucan, you look at Perseus, like they're kind of in this age of the villain. Mm. And I'm sure we could make many political points to it, but I like to think that that was an age that like Christopher Nolan would have loved. They would have (laughs) loved Christopher Nolan movies because everything is a little bit dark. 
everything is more invested in the villain's origin story or like seeing the villain do something that's even more villainous than they could before with like a, a blue tinged shade over everything. Like that's whole aesthetic really seems to be what's exciting to people of that time. And so that might be because they were living in an impre- oppressive uh, regime at that point. They also might have just liked it. Like that might have just been something that was anxious. So I think um, a lot of people say like, oh, do you think Seneca was writing coded messages about Nero? Uh, I think Seneca was writing open messages about Nero at a certain point in his career and it didn't work out well for him. Um, but I don't think that that explains the whole era, especially when you go back into Claudian Rome's like love of these villain characters, because they're clearly the most exciting characters in the plays. So if we're not supposed to be excited by what they're doing, I don't know why these tragedies have survived and why Shakespeare was so invested in like writing his own villains in these styles. Like Richard III would be right at home in a Senecan play. So I think I don't like to push too hard on the politics because I think that that can flatten um, what is instead like an extremely compelling female character where we see like the limits of rage and anger and vengeance and intelligence. And that's probably very scary to some people in the audience, but also probably very exciting to other people in the audience. Yeah. It, it's funny you said that. I mean, it's deeply connected, but I was literally just going to be like, I see so much Shakespeare in Seneca yeah. in a way that I don't in the Greek. And I know that's, I think, I mean, I, I'm going to say this with confidence as if I have any idea, but I've gotten the sense over reading whatever I've read over the years that there was like a really long period where we didn't really have the Greek to work from. It was all Latin, right? So like Shakespeare probably would have had better access to Latin than anything yeah, from the Greek Yeah, or world. Latin translations of right. the Greek plays. Yeah, but I think Shakespeare was also, it wasn't just because he didn't have Euripides and Aeschylus in the same way. I think he he really loved Seneca and tragedy. And there's a long uh, sort of, he's not the first, and there are many others in the Renaissance that seem to have found like the darkness and the claustrophobia and the like um, horrific power differentials without any attempt to teach you a moral message in a lot of these very compelling and exciting theater. Um, And I find them compelling. I mean, I like Christopher Nolan movies also. So I also find them compelling. It's been easier to teach Seneca and tragedy now than ever in the past, because we are in this era of the villain where people end up finding it very interesting. We haven't actually talked about, though, my favorite line in the whole play, which I want to make sure we do, Please. is when Jason, in the end, it's I am actually even going to find the exact line where he suggests that he can't recognize her. And she says, do you rec- don't you recognize your wife? This is how I always leave. And it's this amazing line where she has her dragon chariot. And of course, on one level, and I think Emily Wilson's translation takes it this way, She's just saying, like, I always flee. After having done terrible crimes, I always flee. But the Latin is ambiguous. It almost looks like this meta-theatrical comment of, like, duh, the dragon chariot. Like, this is my big finish. What's wrong with you that you don't know this? It's like her ultimate frustration that she's tied to this character in her final scene that, like, hasn't done the reading, but, like, doesn't know that this is the woman that he's married to. And I think it just sums up so much about the differentiation in their relationship Uh, Her as a character, the fact that she has known from the beginning that this is the ending and she's just been waiting for it uh, and that he is just caught totally blind. Like he has he has no idea what's coming for him. And all he can say is there are no gods in the end. But I just love that line. I think it would have elicited a guffaw from some people in the audience. Like, don't you recognize your wife? This is how I always leave. Yeah, that is the next line that is highlighted in mine. (laughs) Um, it's and it's like, this is the way I always leave a country too, which like, it, it's just like an added, it's like the exile of yeah. it all the, like, just, this is what her life is. And I, but they also the next or like a two lines down that I, and I'm assuming this is a translation, but if you have insights into the Latin, I would love to know because see, like in a way that feels like a total departure or just like one-upping everything Medea says now daddy take your children back yes (laughs) 
and my brain might have exploded a little bit. Like, <laughs> so do you know what the Latin would be to have her transit as daddy? I'm positive that it's pater. Um, but I think it is one of the only times where Medea acknowledges his his social role and his biological role as father. Mm. I think other I would have to go back and look, but she doesn't. He she uses the language of maternity a lot for herself, but she doesn't acknowledge. Like she calls him a father when she says, "Oh, he loves his children." Like there are these moments of realization she has where like Jason's paternity becomes the key to what she's trying to achieve. But I love that translation of daddy because I think it just. <sighs> It so well encapsulates, encapsulates the dripping scorn that she has for him in that moment. And it's another one of these moments where I think the audience would be tempted to laugh. And whether that's a laugh of I'm deeply uncomfortable because you're murdering children on stage, or whether it's a laugh of how stupid is Jason, or even a laugh of like, wow, that's a good line, or all of those things at once. Like, I think there are moments in this play that would elicit laughter. And I don't know it's because they're always funny, um, but she's like really witty she's a very very witty character uh and her the people she goes up against are not and so i think that's another way that she bonds with us yeah i mean it broke me i just like <laughs> there is a yeah. few moments because i i basically have like the last 100 lines to get through uh for the actual script so i just like made sure that i had read them before we got on this call yeah and and i just like screeched a number of times because the last hundred lines of this play is like I mean the whole thing is amazing and then it's just he just ups it all with every passing line it's yeah. just so good and that po moment just before that where Jason says like okay like you've killed our one child you're obviously going to kill the other one because you're nuts so like just just do it already and she's like no no it's almost like she looks at the clock of the timing and is like I have 10 minutes yet buddy we are not ending this thing until every last second of my screen time is over. And she talks about the pleasure in taking slow crime. And I got to say, if you're in the audience and you're sitting there and you've kind of been rooting for Medea in whatever way you are, again, not moral endorsement, but in that she's creating interesting theater. I think that's a moment where you reflect on yourself and you're like, ooh, <laughs> Because you have been looking forward to this final moment, but you also are with Medea in wanting to make Jason hurt as much as possible in the end. And it's like this great moment of like, where does pleasure in watching a tragedy like this come from? Like the answer is really uncomfortable. And I think Medea really likes to linger in how uncomfortable that is for Jason and for us. Yeah. I'm going to use it as like, I'm going to say that the reason, because I was just going to say like, I don't feel uncomfortable at all but I think that that is you also haven't seen children killed on stage in front of you right now no um and there's so there's a lot of things happening in that with me but I'll also like I'll just the easiest one is the sheer volume that I have talked about Medea on this yeah. podcast and I have lost all shame because like I mean this is like probably going to be my 10th episode covering her in whatever way because anytime I find awesome. it she's incredible and she's just so interesting and so I've just gotten over trying to like you know make clear that like obviously my love of Medea does not condone <laughs> child murder yes. because it's just she's so interesting like I don't want to be her I don't want to be friends with her but oh my god I would read about her I don't think to she the has end friends. of time no yeah. the closest is the nurse and I'm kind she of now convinced yeah. that she's in her head yeah she's she doesn't really want friends. She doesn't want us as friends, but she does want our our excitement. Yes. Oh my God. She has it. Like, yeah. I just, I, it, the, the last one thing line that comes up yeah. in the Latin a lot, and this is also happens in the Thyestes and a couple of his other plays, like words for pleasure just start being heaped towards the end of the play. And mm. I think that is, I mean, why do you go to the theater? You go to the theater because you want something entertaining. What is entertaining? It's pleasure, even if it's something that is like disturbing in front of you. And I think Seneca really leans in hard in the end of this through Medea of there is supposed to be pleasure here. It is supposed to be exciting and interesting. You're supposed to feel something at the end of this. And I do not think that thing in, Thene in Seneca Theater is catharsis. I do not yeah, think that yeah. is what he is going for. He is going for voluptas, pleasure. And I think I don't feel bad either. Like, it's yeah. just, it's so compelling. Yeah. Well, and I think your Euripides, he didn't do the same thing, but he did something really similar with Medea 
in a in a kind of departure from the sort of like tradition of the other tragedians, which is that like you do like her. You yeah. understand why she did what she did. And, and the I mean, chorus really helps in Euripides because yes. the chorus is like, we shouldn't be on her side, but we are kind of. Yeah, like that's the thing you appreciate her. And I mean, I love Euripides more than the others by like a long shot. And it has so much to do with Medea. I mean, even just the using of the deus ex machina as her when Mm -hmm. that was otherwise like reserved for an actual divine intervention. And then she's like, here are my dead children in my chariot. Let me fly off into the sunset. Like, so I think Euripides really primed us and obviously Seneca's audience too, to be like, you know what? like this woman has valid, you know, reasons to be angry. And, and of course in Seneca's, he's like, you know, for all that Euripides convinced us that her anger was valid. Seneca was like, here is why it's so much more valid than you even thought. Yeah, You know, like he just adds so many details and so much like righteousness. But what were you saying about the pleasure? Cause I was just scrolling through to try to find these lines. Cause they really stood out to me as like, right towards the end um she starts talking about uh you know basically trying to i think it's when she's gonna convince herself that she can kill her kids yeah and she says like i'm happy that i ripped my brother's head away i'm happy i sliced his limbs and glad i stripped my father of his ancestral treasure i'm glad i set on the daughters to murder the old man yeah like yeah she is she's not unhappy about anything that she has done and it's reminiscent to when the nurse is like you know when when it's revealed that that creusa and creon are dead and the nurse is like go now like this is your time you need to leave and she's like if i wasn't leaving then i'm not leaving now like i i've done this i'm keeping going because she needs an audience she needs to see how people have reacted like without that reception it's nothing to her and I love that her last line is this idea, I will fly amid the winds on my chariot with wings. Like she's taking the language of Horace and Ovid and all of these like poets. That's the language of poetic immortality at the mm. end of their works when they say like this, I'm going to last forever. The things that I did are so impressive that people are going to be talking about them and reading them until the end of time. And Medea says that throughout, but then it like gets really, really metapoetic at the end. This idea of like, oh no, like I'm going to live on in poetic immortality. This version of Medea is going to stick with you all in the end. And all Jason can say is there are no gods. Which, she owns it. She owns who she is. She just doesn't like when people undercut it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's so interesting that you used those points to connect to, you know, these Roman poets who I'm not as familiar with because, and I'm going to find it because there's this moment that was like just epic, epic poetry in like a line. And she, oh, here, it's like her using an epic simile in a way that I think is fresh in this because I, I, it stood out to me immediately. I was like, oh, this is, this is an epic simile when she's like, as when the wild winds make their brutal wars and on both sides, the seas lift up discordant waves and she keeps going on and on. But like, yeah, yeah, Yeah. it's just like, it's the most epic poem line and yeah. it yeah so she's just calling on all of these different traditions <sighs> in her own voice and yes. it's another thing that i think is much more pronounced when there's not a messenger speech because like messenger speeches are often in greek tragedy where we come so close to epic mm-hmm. um and that happens in some Senecan tragedies but in this one like no the longest speeches are hers and she controls all the genres and then she also is like constantly analogized both by herself and other people to forces of nature and so she just is this like larger than life character, um, but who is also allowed, like even in her witchiness and even in her supernatural powers, like she still is a human woman in this throughout as well. Like he doesn't make her so grotesque that she's not recognizable as a person. And you could have, like there are ways you can tell the story that lean into um, the fact that she isn't quite human or that she has this immortal legacy. And I think that's important too, because I think, again, it all comes back to this anxiety of like female anger is a really big theme in this play. And Seneca's message seems to be, it can take you out. Yeah. I I mean, I like, cause he makes some, he makes a lot of divine connections in yeah. a way that I found really interesting. Like there's a lot of reminders of where she comes from and who she's related to. Like she calls Phaethon her cousin, which I was yeah. like, Oh, love that. Um, I also mythologically have, I have so many thoughts. I realize I could absolutely talk about this play forever, but I've, I'm going to try to lay out 
my thoughts because we have like 20 minutes. But okay, mythologically, I'm so curious, and maybe you don't know because this is my you know, my Greek, my knowledge of myth is very Greek. And so he's made some changes that are relevant to the Roman period. Um, so one being that like, he's got that later conflation of Apollo with Helios and the sun. Yeah. So it's like her grandfather is Apollo, which is really interesting. Yeah. And like, obviously it's not Seneca inventing this, but it makes her so much more impressive than it being Helios. Like it, it, Apollo is way bigger, but there's also this connection that again is not, you know, prevalent in, you know, the classical period and earlier, which is what I know, um, where Diana as a, where she becomes so explicitly a moon goddess then gets connected with Hecate. Yeah. So she's like calling on Diana a lot for this, yeah. which adds so many things. Like there's that virgin kind of aspect that like huntress, but then melding with Hecate. Yeah. I just, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's incredible. and the Apollo connection, the sort of uh, smooshing of all of the gods of the sun in various ways, also has metapoetic connotations, right? Like it connect—that's he is the patron god of most Roman poets, and so she also gets to claim descent from that as a creator. And I think the Diana aspect allows her to take this Olympian, but also connect it to her powers, which are much more chthonic. Even though she's constantly being connected and connecting herself to heavenly gods. She clearly finds her inspiration, her power source to be gods of the underworld, the Furies included, but not just, not only the Furies, others that are there. And I love that, that separation. Like she controls the heavens, she controls hell, but she chooses to get her powers from hell. Yeah. Well, yeah. She's so explicitly when, when she's calling up like all of her magic and all of that, like one, she calls like all the snakes in the world, which is like the most chthonic thing you can do. Yeah. Like every and snake. Roman as well. Like, oh, great. Fear of snakes. <laughs> Oh, no really? Like yeah. I think from Virgil on, it's like snakes bad. We don't like snakes. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, I identify with that. Um, I do too. There are a lot of snakes yeah. where I live in North Carolina oh, and they scare no. me. No, it's gross and awful. Um, yeah, no, snakes are not my jam, except for in uh, textual imagery, I guess, because this was like a moment that I was so deeply here for. Just don't show me a real snake. Yeah. Um, I say that looking down at my own hand where I have a snake tattoo, but that's because it doesn't look real and it's for Dionysus. Oh, which connects me direct. This is the question I had earlier and then I got caught up with the Apollo. Um, oh, no. Okay, sorry. Now I'm bouncing around. Um, we, so the... Uh, back to the chthonic nature. So she pulls up all these snakes and then not only that, but she, um, it, she calls on like everyone who's in Tartarus and like gets them to stop all of their punishments. She's like, Ixion's wheel's going to stop. Like Tantalus yeah. is going to have a drink. Sisyphus is going to have that boulder roll back on him. Like, yeah, the, the connections that she makes so explicitly with the underworld and with all of these kind of chthonic ideas it's just so powerful um but i also she gets connected she gets referred to as a main ad a lot of times yeah and i'm curious about what the implication is there like were in roman do you know if they were like less positively viewed that was poorly phrased but no I know what you mean um yeah so it becomes this sort of uh, Lily Panucci has a really great chapter of this in a book that she just wrote like the stereotype of Roman sort of Bacchants or Minads is of like the most terrifying unhinged woman that you can imagine which of course is present <laughs> in the Greek imagination um but in the Romans there was actually even a sort of legal precedent for that there was the sort of fear in the mid-republic of Bacchic worship and this law that was passed, the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, against the worship of Dionysus and against the Bacchanalia. And it clearly didn't take because these rites remain a central part of Roman religion, um, but not actually a central part of Roman theater in the way that they were in Athens. And so it sort of comes to be associated with extremely, again, from the Roman patriarchal imagination, unhinged women that are tapping into types of power that can't be controlled that are extremely dangerous to patriarchal structures um, and that threaten sort of the sanctity of the state. And I think Seneca is sort of getting it almost directly from um, Virgil's The Aeneid, where often women out of control from Dido on forward are analogized to Bacchants. And in Dido, the idea is like, oh, well, you should be lucky she didn't have a baby with Aeneas because what would she have done to that child? Which I think Medea then circles full with. 
but often Virgil and then later epic poets when women are acting in a way that is particularly not conducive to what the epic narrative needs or the male characters in the epic or society needs. They're analogized to Bacchants, even if they're doing like pretty normal things. Um, like uh, Amada doesn't want her daughter to marry the stranger that just came in. Why does she have to be called a Bacchant <laughs> for wanting what seems to be a pretty realistic marriage for her child? Uh, so I think all of that is tapping into this idea that Medea is being connected to the stereotype. But I think what's so interesting about Seneca's Medea is like she's doing things that from the male point of view seem crazy. Um, but Seneca is very careful to underline the extreme rationality of her position. He gives her a lot of powers of reason and logic and deduction, and she feels emotion, but there's no sense of this binary that we have that's both ancient and modern of, oh, if you're emotional, you're not rational. She's both. She is in touch with her emotions. She can label her emotions, but she is probably the most rational character in the play. And so I think the characters that label her a Bacchant see one part of her, like they're reacting to what they see in front of them. But we as the audience get to see inside her brain because of all of the monologues that she gives and the things that she shares with us. And I think we can see that that's a totally inappropriate image because it's just reacting to what they see as opposed to who she is, which is a very rational and therefore much more terrifying person. Well, yeah. And every time she she gives these rational speeches... It's like, at least, you know, when she's talking to Creon and Jason, it's like in one ear and out the other, like neither of them actually, when they respond after she's given this like epic list of why she's right, um, like Creon literally, when once she gives the whole list of like how she basically saved Greece single-handedly, Creon yeah. is just like, why haven't you left yet? Yeah. You're still here. Yeah. Like that's it. Like it's, it's like she can, you know, defend herself with all of the rationale in the world, like She's I've never used the word shrewd, I think, in a podcast before until yeah. this. And I'm like, I that's just so perfect yeah. for her. And, you know, but it's like she can do that and and the audience can take in every single thing she said and they can understand every single thing about her and it doesn't get her anywhere. Yeah. It's both satisfying and frustrating and like Well, because you get frustrated <sighs> with her. Like yeah. you are starting to feel the frustration that she feels, especially when Creon says things like, well, I'm obviously not a tyrant. And you think, I mean, you've just checked all the boxes of tyrannical behavior on stage in front of us. But what I love about that when he says you're still here is like he can sort of come off as this tough guy. But when he first comes on, right, there's that scene where there are a bunch of silent characters on stage that must be his armed guards. And he's really concerned that she's going to touch him. Mm -hmm. And he just keeps saying, like, keep her away, keep her away. And there's no sign that those people leave the stage. And so I like to imagine, if we imagine a full performance, that there's just this, like, phalanx of people between Creon and Medea. And he doesn't like when she moves closer. And so he's acting like, oh, you're this little fly. I'm just going to swat you. But he clearly is terrified of her and doesn't actually want her to get close. And I think that that would have some comic import, in addition to that I'm obviously not a tyrant, which Medea kind of rolls her eyes at. Yeah. I wonder how they would have her dressed like yeah. just hearing that I can imagine her and and the way she behaved with Jason at the end like I can see they having her performed as though she is this like little helpless woman so she like visibly would look like that and then behave as she does and that would just be so powerful yeah, visually consuming I would I would love and this is not at all ancient but if I were staging this in the modern world I would want her to have a tearaway outfit where she was like in rags and so there is that visual disconnect between what she's capable of and this. And in the end, when she leaves, she just gets like this bright purple, like flaming sort of outfit as she goes out because that's yes. who she's truly been all along. Yes. I mean, that would be so good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is the thing that reminded me of this, but do you, do you listen to Taylor Swift at all? If I made yeah. a Taylor Swift reference? Great. Yeah. So I, I don't know what it is about the album Folklore, but I have it playing when I write a lot. Like it just works brilliantly with my ADHD to like focus my brain into what I need to be doing. And so I just listen to it over and over again. And, but while I was writing some of these last bits, the song Mad Woman came on and I'm like literally writing this and then listening to these lines. And I was like, oh, like, I just think this song is Medea. And now that. <laughs> As the audience will know by the time this episode comes out, that is the title of the last episode yeah. is There's Nothing Like a Mad Woman. Because, like, 
oh, it just fit so perfectly, but came on as I was writing. And I was like, well, this is just, this is picturesque. To me, I have to say uh, my soundtrack for Seneca's Medea is um, a Silver Springs, C- Stevie Nicks and Fleetwood Mac, Silver Springs. Yes. Especially the performance, like their reunion performance, where she's just staring him down and getting closer and closer as she sings these, these lyrics against him. That is the vibe. Also, I, I kind of imagine Medea in a Stevie Nicks-esque outfit, like with all the drapes and the drama. And so to me, that's her song. Hell yes. No, that's so We can make a Medea soundtrack. I think that would be great. So this is perfect. So I I made a playlist on Spotify of all my, well, what it was originally was just all the episodes that I've done on Medea for people who want to like recap um, because I've done a lot. And then once I heard Mad Woman and Connect, I was like, I'm just going to toss that on. Why not? Um, and then I made the cover of it, the tweet that I know you've seen that I did, uh, which is she's everything and he's just Jason. Yeah. I was like, I just think all of this works, not yeah. least because because the word barbarian is how we get the word Barbara, which is how the word how we get the name Barbie. Yeah. And I just need that to be said, uh, which I've already done on the podcast. But here we are. It's just all it's just all perfect. Um, but yes, if you have any other songs, I'm going to just start tossing things into this playlist along with it because yeah. Silver Springs is going in next. <laughs> Oh, it's just so good. Um, okay. We are very much running out of time, but I want, um, to mention the last line again, uh, which you brought up because it's just so good. Cause Jason, like, you know, there's a couple last lines, but the very last words that Jason says are basically, there are no gods (laughs) wherever you go. Um, and I think maybe like looking at it again, it doesn't quite make the same connection I kind of had in my head briefly, but it did make me immediately think of um, Sophocles' Trichinii, where Mm. the last line is all that you've seen here is God. Yeah. And like, I think it's a stretch to connect them, but I want to anyway, you know, because it just feels kind of right. There's also like some very strong, I wanted to say Heraclean, but we are talking about Rome. So Herculean references in here, like she uses nessos's like blood poison really explicitly yep. and she's like this is the stuff that killed hercules so oh we know that the trachinii in particular was like super popular mm. in rome they really liked it um and then the hercules Viteus kind of tells the same story uh in a interesting way where Deonera like becomes medea there's like all this weird intertextual uh windows there what I okay. love about that final line is also like, so the final word in the Latin is gods, because mm. Latin can do that. And the first word in the play is gods. God damn. And so there's this beautiful <sighs> ring composition of the play opens with us knowing there are gods, knowing there are gods above, below, knowing Medea is in touch with all of them, that they are all listening to her, that she is claiming authority over them as well as descent from them. So it's yet another way in the end where Jason is just super out of touch because I think what he must mean is like there are no gods that are on my side or like there are no gods if there are gods I don't recognize this world and of course that's true like Jason clearly doesn't understand the world that he's been living in the marriage that he's experienced (laughs) the story that he's living out all of these things Um, but I just love that that helplessness that Jason feels in the end because the only comfort he can imagine is if she's wrong if she's not going to get away with this and if she's not going to get to go and live this like sequel life that she has. But of course we know she is. Yeah. I, she also, there's one point where she tells Jason that she's going to like leave his gods behind. Yeah. Which, yeah, there's, yeah, there's some great, Oh, there's some great God imagery. Oh, this is just, it's just so good and fun. Um, okay. I, I could talk about this forever. I won't keep you longer though. Um, (laughs) thank you. Um, okay. I'm just trying to make sure. Is there anything else that you feel like we haven't missed? And also like, or, or if you also have somewhere to be in the five minutes I gave you uh, that we have left, that's fine too. I'm trying to think. I mean, I think we have covered it all. Like I wanted to make sure we talked about, um, like one of the things that Medea is so concerned about is satisfaction, Mm. like not just vengeance, but what is satisfying vengeance. And it's clear to her in the end, that the murder of Creon and Creusa is just not that satisfying. Um, It didn't bring her much pleasure. And when she kills the first child, she thinks that's satisfying because she knows it will hurt Jason, but Jason didn't see it. And so it's not satisfying. 
And that's another big thing with Senec and villains that I think plays into a word I tell to my students is ineffitude. Like what is enough, this concept? And these villains never seem to realize what is enough until the end. But I think Medea is one of the only characters that actually ends the play satisfied. So there's yeah. always yet another thing like, oh, I wish I'd done it this way or I wish that this existed so I could do that. Like there's this constant feeling of nothing is enough in other villains. But Medea seems really damn self-satisfied by the end of this play. And I think that's really interesting because I also think that is uncomfortable um, in the best way, in the way that I love. Yes, yes. I did love that moment where she, they're dead and she's just kind of like, yeah, that was not enough. Like that's yeah. not it. Like, what else like, can I do? I was expecting to feel something, and I don't feel something. Yeah. Oh, Jason's here. He can see it now. That's what I've been missing. I want to see his face. And, of course, we then get to see his face as he watches this because it's not being reported. Um, and I think when she says that, the audience is probably also like, yeah, I also want to see his face. So, again, we're yes. right there with her. Well, especially with this particularly clueless Jason. Yeah. Like, just absolutely off-the-wall, ridiculous man who just does not seem to take in any single thing that happens around him. Yeah. And yet he thinks that he has it all locked in. Like, he thinks his excuses are fine. He thinks he can just... He thinks that Medea's that Medea is overcome with erotic jealousy. So he just misreads her from the beginning because she couldn't care less who he's sleeping with. I think she makes that pretty clear. Um, it's everything else. It's the lack of respect for her yeah. heroism and her role that makes her mad. So he just he just misreads at every possible option. Yeah. Well, that does make me think, though, like there were a few moments where it seems like she wants him back. Like, it seems like she would take him back. And those really surprised me. Do yeah. You, like, yeah. Do you, do you think they'd stand out or there's something more in there? I think so. I think there are moments where the character genuinely is open to him still having feelings for her. Um, but I think she also points out throughout all of this how close love and hate are as emotions. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think what she's really afraid of is being forgotten. Um, that he can just so easily excise her from his lived experience. And she even makes fun of him when he leaves the stage, when he's like placated by whatever bullshit she's just fed him. And she's like, really? Like, you've forgotten who I am? How dumb are you? And I think that's where contempt starts to come in for Jason. And she's no longer that interested in getting him back. Um, But before that, I think it's like a whole constellation of like sexual desire, but also like they were a team and a partnership. And how dare he forget that like how dare he not acknowledge that that's there and so I think part of her her desire for him to still recognize her and still want her is less to do with I want my man back and is more to do with I just want some goddamn respect (laughs) yeah that makes sense that really who doesn't identify with that hell yeah no that 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 fixes her for me so thank you (laughs) because I was like these are the things that don't work for me like I don't know why she would do that but that yeah because it's not about him it's not about him. Yeah. Because no one wants about, him. I don't it's understand. It's not about love. Yeah. It's about respect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, clearly I could keep going on forever, but we will. This was, the, I mean, this was the greatest play, but I'm also just so glad that I was able to talk to you about it. Thank you yeah. so much for doing this. This was so fun. I'm so <laughs> glad. I really like, this reminds me of when I read The Alkestis. Because oh, I didn't so know, good. yes, and I didn't know anything about it really, and I, I just opened it as like a play to cover because I love Euripides, and I was like, what is this? This is yeah. incredible. And then I had on um, Ellie Mack and Roberts, who equally was like, it's just like the very same vibe of having yeah. on a guest. I mean, like, I just want to talk about how incredible this play is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> here for it. Very excited. I did awesome. love your um, tweet of like the. I think I might love a Roman tragedy. <laughs> I can't explain how much it's broken my brain. Um, yes. And then also hearing all of the Roman context, which is exactly what I wanted because I knew there would be so much. But like, it's just so much more interesting having all of the information that you had. So thank you. Uh, yes. And also like, I mean, totally selfishly, like I had to talk to somebody about this. Yeah. Play. <laughs> I mean, as I said, I was just talking to these uh, graduate students actually at this NEH workshop. And one of them said, I think Seneca's Medea is better than Euripides. And I won't name them. (laughs) Ask me not to. Uh, And everyone said, oh, bold. And I was like, but have you read it though? And they hadn't. And I was like, okay. And I gave them my pitch. I was like, super witchy, super subaltern, 
smarter than everyone, like anger takes down the patriarchy, like all these things. And in the end, they said, all right, we'll give it a chance. And I was like, okay, because you can't. Yeah. I don't think we have to choose which one's better because I think Seneca's Medea could not exist without Euripides' Medea. And I wouldn't say that about most Seneca tragedies. I don't actually think they're that close all the time to what's sometimes claimed as their Greek model. But I think he really expects you to know Euripides' Medea and to take a number of those things for granted so that he can totally flip the script in different places and surprise you. Like, that's fun to him. Yeah. I think I needed that reassurance um, because I've been having some thoughts. (laughs) <laughs> some thoughts about how much I love Seneca's Medea but it's funny like I can't even think of how many times I've had on a guest who's been like but Seneca's Medea and I'm like no I don't I don't know I am not no. convinced and now I'm like oh shit they were right everyone was right, right. it turns it's out so- you just have to read it <laughs> and it's amazing <laughs> it's so good it's so good oh my god uh and my pitch for the Thyestes is that even though it's the play that doesn't have female characters uh Atreus takes as his um inspiration Procne and Philomela from Ovid's oh. Metamorphoses and he like legit just says that repeatedly so it's like this amazing mass of Ovid fandom but like one-upping Ovid in grossness and horror and child eating um and it, it's I think if you liked the Medea you will also like that I mean frankly I was sold on it based on the fact that it exists um yeah. like on it after having read this I was like there's a Thyestes I'm doing it yeah. um That helps even more. But I also think that there's something really to be said for a lack of female characters in that play. Yeah. Because it's, I think that's kind to women. Yes. Not, not involving them in that absolute fucking mess. (laughs) Except for the Fury who is here for it. Right. Of course. Like, Like, I'm going to take this stuff down. Yeah. Like, like, that's her job. So, of course, she'd be there. Yeah. But otherwise, in the background. yes, like that's the only thing a woman would do. Let's be on yeah. it. No, I mean, yeah. you know, I'm being unfair because Medea exists, but still, yeah. it's not unheard of or unreasonable to suggest that there were no women involved in everything that happens yeah. there. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, spooky season is coming up. So I know what I'm doing now. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. OK, <laughs> thank you so much. Do you do you have anywhere that you want, um, you know, anything you want to share with my listeners in terms of like reading more from you or following you or anything that you might want to promote? Is it OK if I say no? No, that's absolutely that, fine, yeah. too. I usually yeah. give that out because also it's like so putting on the spot. Yeah. Also with Twitter the way it is. God. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just honestly. happy people are going to think about Seneca's Medea. Honestly, yes. that just brings me joy. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, it's oh, my God. It's so fucking good. Well, nerds, I mean, that play and that conversation was really something. I am I am so sold on Seneca's plays. I am sold. Thyestes is absolutely coming for spooky season because, frankly, I was already planning to handle that cursed family in more detail during that season because, like, who doesn't love a murderous and cannibalistic family of famous Greek heroes? But having this play and hearing how good and violent it is, oh, I am so excited. It is made for my spooky season episodes. So you just stay tuned. Huge thank you to Lauren for speaking with me about this. It was so much fun. My ADHD went wild a few times there because there's just too many things I wanted to talk about, too many ideas and incredible moments that I wanted to learn more about. And Lauren just went with me on the whole journey. So thank you. What a ridiculously fun and supremely informative episode, if I do say so myself. And I do. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, perhaps more colloquially known as the assistant producer. I've got to get that word colloquial out of this. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Listen on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where I'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. I am Liv and I love this shit. (laughs) 